Hi there, and um, welcome to another one of my writers recommends uh, from the book room. Um, I'm really, really thrilled today because we have Mark Hamer with us. And Mark has done a curation. Well, <laughs> this is a bit where <laughs> this is a bit where I get a bit confused because I say he's done a nature writing curation. We'll come to that, but just hold that thought for a second. So um, those who are not familiar, um, I have asked um, some authors who write within a certain genre to put together lists of their favorite books or the ones that really speak to them in that genre, the ones that they press into other people's hands or one they go back to time and again. Um, and they've picked four books within the, the genre that inspires them. And they may be an entry point into a genre. So you can try something that you haven't you know, wouldn't necessarily gravitate towards, or it could be real finds for people who are already familiar with the genre. So today we have Mark Hamer. Hello, Mark. Hi, hi, Anna. So nice to have you with us. Um, nice to be here. Yeah, I was just, um, I was just kind of quickly explaining to you before we started the recording that your curation has been flying off my shelves in my first weekend of my pop-up bookshop and so quickly that I hadn't actually been able to write notes about why you chosen <laughs> the books that you had because they were just so popular and I don't know what what do you think about that I mean do you think uh, why do you think those books out of all of them might be speaking to people I think these are books that I particularly love. And as, as somebody who's classed as a nature writer, I kind of look at that as in a very, as a very broad um, brief, really. Mm. Um, and I think these are particularly accessible books. You know, although there's a couple of volumes of poetry here as well, and poetry doesn't yeah. generally sell that very well. I think they're very accessible because they're easily understand. I understand them and I love them and they kind of go to my heart, really. I think all you have to do is pick one of these books up and open it at random and you will find a line that you will love immediately <laughs> and I yeah. think that's that's why they work for me. I wonder also if maybe with these times that we've had that where you know in these dark Covid times whether we we did turn back to nature as a kind yeah. of medicine in those times because it was kind of all we had really that walk out and yeah we had a particularly sunny time the first lockdown and people yeah. were re-familiarizing themselves with birds and trees and so well, I the skies went quiet, the aeroplanes stopped flying, the birds, you know, I, I was in a town and the ducks that were normally on the river next to the car park were actually inhabiting the car park and walking across the middle of the road because there was no traffic about. You know, it, it was almost rewilded everything, you know, the, yeah. the people weren't driving around and it was absolutely wonderful. I, yeah, I remember <laughs> that seeing... aspect anyway. I mean... Well, yeah. Um, I remember seeing some videos on social media of like deer wandering into town centres and things. <laughs> yeah, crazy. There were dolphins in the Thames and things like that. <laughs> I mean, if only we could have stayed like that. How wonderful. We could have yeah. shared, shared yeah. our spaces. But I just wanted to uh, quote you just to start off with. So when I asked you to put together this um, curation for us, and, and first, before we come on to your books, uh, sorry, the books you've chosen, I just want to talk about your book. Um, but I'm just going to quote. So I, I emailed you and said, oh, I absolutely love you to do a nature writing curation for the book room. And this is what you replied to me. I rarely read nature books. I'm not a naturalist or a collector of things or information about things. And I don't really care about the difference between a hawk and a falcon or how many of them there are. I'm interested in the flow of nature itself, the coming into being of things and their fading away, how we are part of that coming and going and how we can live a good life with that awareness, which yeah. feels like poetry in itself, to be honest. <laughs> but I just wondered if you could explain a little bit more. I mean, obviously that encapsulates what you're feeling but I yeah. just wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that well I think that is what I'm interested in I think as a as a human being walking on this earth you you well let me start another point you want to be a writer and you become a writer and you start to write the things that you love and that you believe in and the things that you want to say and then if you're lucky enough, you'll get out there and get into the market and people say, oh, this is this kind of writing, this is this mm -hmm. genre, this is genre, this genre. And I kind of don't think of it like that. I write the thing that I love and the thing that I love is the fact that I'm here on this planet. We are all here on this planet. 
And although it's painful and difficult, it's bloody incredible. You know, it's a wonderful thing. We haven't got an alternative. Here we are. But mm. if you take your time and look at the small things that you do every day, you know, mm. the waking up in the morning and hearing the birds singing and making a cup of tea and having some breakfast. If you focus on that instead of focusing on where you're going to go on your holidays, mm. suddenly life goes boom and gets expanded into mm. every moment of every day becoming a wonderful thing. And mm. that's what I'm interested in. I sit by my back door and I see the sparrows, a tiny little garden in the middle of the city, but I've got sparrows and there are hedgehogs that come and visit sometimes. And I can sit for hours just watching the rain dripping on the leaves. You know, instead of I don't have a television, I don't watch television, I sit at my back door and watch the rain dripping. On. So, all right, a little bit crazy, perhaps. But <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's almost mindfulness, this key, this word that everybody likes, you know, it's it's a it's just focusing on the present and um and that's kind of what meditation's about as well. Just kind of you know, with toddlers, like with kids, yeah. they you know, they pick up a stone or a pebble yeah. and turn it around and they look at it and inspect it and you cannot draw I their attention. It. <laughs> <laughs> I, st I still do that. I mean, yeah. the thing about mindfulness and meditation, I, I, I am a meditator and have been for a long, long time, but I kind of never push that or, you know, because we all live in our own different lives in our own different ways and we have to find our own path through that and we have to explore the things that work for us. And I think that's the thing I'm interested in, exploring the things that work for us, how we all live in completely different ways. Mm. So reading these books, these people all live in completely different ways, mm. but they found a path through which relates themselves to the environment that they're in. And the right. environment they're in is the birds and the rain and the winds and the weather, mm. you know, the loss of loved ones and people coming into their lives and people going out. I see all that as nature, mm. it is nature, you know. Mm you will find somebody to love and they will come to you and then perhaps they will go away again in one way or another. This is nature. This is what life is. I, I love that stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work that I do with Wendy Mitchell, um, who uh, lives with dementia. Um, and we've written two books together. We've had yeah. a third coming out next year. And her, dementia for her, at the start of her, you know, the disease trajectory, she felt like it really shrunk her world down you yeah. know she wasn't able to walk um, sorry work anymore she wasn't able to drive but what she discovered was walking and and people yeah. often say that people with dementia wander they don't seem to think that they've got this purpose but she walks for miles and miles every day she takes pictures of nature um and she does exactly what you said she lives in the moment and in the yeah. present and finding the beauty in small things every single day she sets off before sunrise for a walk oh. and there was another story actually when we did a dementia workshop together of um a man I think who had dementia and his daughter took him to the went to the care home to take him out for a walk and when she took him out in his wheelchair he started having a conversation with the birds yeah. so they were tweeting something and he was tweeting something back to them and I mean to anybody else that might have looked a bit strange yeah. however she could see the beauty in the fact that as far as he was concerned and perhaps the birds too they were communicating with each other Connected. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. yeah I totally understand that I'm I was 66 a couple of weeks ago and I was out in a garden and I thought I can't remember what that plant is called my memory I'm losing things you know and I came back and I had a good thing about it and and realized that I wasn't bothered to be yeah. honest, yeah. <laughs> that I was still enjoying the things that I couldn't remember the name of, you know, eventually there were dahlias and things like that. And eventually some of the names came back and some of them didn't, but it kind of didn't bother me because I was there with them. There were the fat bumblebees sitting in the flower head and it's all quite twee, you know, but it is very, very beautiful and it's very, very real. This is life and death and things yeah. change and our lives change moment to moment. And if you're thinking about something else, you're missing all that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, which brings us nicely onto this Seed to Dust, your absolutely beautiful book, which has also been a hit in my um, first weekend. As it's nice to hear. Yeah, I know. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but I mean, even the title kind of gives away something of what you were just saying, little, really, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you tell us a little bit about this book and the creating of it? 
Um, that book was written after I had finished, because I was, did work as a gardener in, a, in an old lady's garden and, and as a jobbing gardener. Um, writers have to try and make money any way they possibly can. I mean, I've written since I was a very small child, but it's taken me decades to get to the point where I can make an income from it. So I worked as a gardener and I worked as a gardener for a very long time for this old lady in this very large it would have been called an estate at one point, a very large garden with a meadow and a pond. And that book basically is about my relationship with that garden through the year mm -hmm. and my relationship with the lady, Mrs. Kashmir, who owned the garden, mm -hmm. right? A very wealthy lady. I was just a gardener with no money. So, you know, it was a very interesting relationship. And it was a kind of, we very rarely spoke. You know, we walked past each other and it'd be morning, Mark, morning, Miss Kashmir. And that would, that would be the extent of our conversation for five days. You know, mm -hmm. we couldn't say much more than that. But there was a kind of really deep relationship between us. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we'd catch each other's eye and it's not a kind of um, a romantic relationship in any way whatsoever. But also it wasn't employer, employee anymore. It was like I was a bit of her landscape and she mm -hmm. was a bit of my landscape. <laughs> You know, so we were both working together on this garden, which was, you know, and like any garden, was a work of art. You know, you work on it and it changes through the years and keep working to create something. Mm -hmm. And we were both doing it in our own very different ways, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, that's what that book is about. It's about going through the seasons and it's about plunging through the mud with wheelbarrows full of manure and growing dahlias. But it's also about the foxes in the meadow and that kind of thing as well. And just being there each day, every day in the frost or the rain or the sunshine and working through the year. It's also a very human thing to, to create something together, whether that's a child, a piece of art, yeah. a garden, is yeah. a bonding thing for humans, isn't it? I think it is, yeah. I mean, it's, it's I think writing is quite a solitary life. You tend mm. to do it on your own. Mm. And, it feels, it doesn't feel natural mm. to, until the point when you start to share it with somebody else. And when somebody else comes into the, I'm very lucky, my wife is also a writer, mm. right? So every day we share our work and where we are and our frustrations with the work. And, and that's when it starts to come to life, when it's mm. on the page and it's just in your head and on the page and you're trying to build it and build it and build it and turn it into something else. Mm. Um, it's it's a fabulous feeling, a fabulous creative experience, but it doesn't really come to life until somebody else gets it, until yeah. somebody else sees it. And if they understand it, wow, that's a wonderful thing. If you do a piece of work that's all come out of your mind and your life and somebody else sees it and goes, yeah, I like that. Or, yeah, I understand that. Or gives it a bit of poetry. A thing today, right, I just... My, my next book that's coming out, which is called Spring Rain, it's coming out uh, uh, actually in February. And I've just been looking at the, um, the actors that they're getting to voice it. Mm. And there was this one guy that came through, and, and I don't know the actor particularly, but his voice, now this lovely Welsh voice. And I thought, Welsh people have got quite a relationship with poetry. They learn it at school and they do recitations at school to my steadbot and things like that. Yeah. And he got it straight away. In his voice, I could hear. I was almost, I was almost crying when I could hear him reading this. And that this is just wonderful. He's given it a new life that yeah. I didn't know it had. Yeah. You know? yeah. So somebody else gets it. It's theirs. Then it's like, yeah, absolutely. Know? And the same with the garden. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I was talking to someone the other day about you know the fact that I'm asking writers to come and do these curations, and that you know some people I speak to find it a bit, bit scary to approach yeah. a writer to ask them something but I say you know we are alone most of the time in our writing and so actually you know we create something and it might take years for it to yeah. come you know to publication and then we do actually want to talk about it <laughs> because yeah we, yeah we do we can get a bit curmudgeonly because we spend so much time on our own you know or we can get a little bit into and find it difficult to communicate sometimes but once you actually start talking about it it's it, we do want to talk about it and it, the the interesting thing is that book seeds dust i've written another one since then so that one you know i've kind of almost forgotten about it because mm. you do your piece of work and you send it off and mm. it's like okay i'm on to the next thing now and this is what i'm doing now and this is where 100 percent of my attention is and mm. you kind of forget what you did in the last one and then somebody comes to talk to you about it you go, 
oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember that bit now. <laughs> Oh, what well, do you want to have a? Do you want to talk us through some of your selections? Who, who have we got up first? I think we'll look at uh, the man who planted trees first. Okay, yeah, that's right. really popular. It's it's a lovely. It's a very very short book. It's what is it? It's well, it's it's more. I don't even know what it is. It's thirty one pages long. Can you call what? Can you call that? But I love it. I absolutely love this. Not only do I love the story, I love the way the story came to be written. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the story is about a chap um, who was asked to enter, who, who entered a writing competition. I think it was a Reader's Digest. And the topic of the writing competition was the most interesting man you have ever met, or something along those lines. So we wrote this story about this interesting man he'd met. And he was a man in uh, Italy, I believe, who was a farmer and who basically carried a pocket of acorns around with him. And everywhere he went, with his, he had this walking stick with a spike on the end and he dropped acorns in it. And the writer went to see him again a few years later. Eventually, over years, a massive oak forest had grown up, right? Through this simple man doing this simple thing with a pocket of acorns. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautifully written and it's just lovely and poetic. And it's, the illustrations are gorgeous and you can read it in an hour, yeah. right? But the thing about how it came to be written, I find fascinated as well. And I don't know whether I should, I should reveal that one. Have you read them? I have you know No. <laughs> okay. The way it came to be written was there was this competition. Um, somebody from the Reader's Digest who set up the competition went to look for the forest and it didn't exist. Yeah. Right. The guy, the writer had made it up and they tried to take his prize off him. Right. They, he won the first prize and they tried to take his prize off him. And I think he let them have their prize back as well. But the whole book went completely, as it would be in those days, viral around the world. There are so many editions of this book around in different covers and in hundred dozens of languages and I just love the story but I love that reason how the story came to be written as well yeah and it's a bit like you and your flower like does it really matter you know if it's a story it's a story everything is a story though everything that's in your head is a story yeah. anyway yeah. the things that you remember are only there because you are reimagining them in your head yeah. so we don't even know what truth is really not really show us the cover of your one again i know i have a different so it's the it's the man who planted trees and um do you know how to pronounce his uh, his name uh jean giono i believe giono. okay yeah so that's a lovely little book and and that's the thing as well um i mean all of your books are you know quite short books um yeah. but they've they've got a big they're containing quite a lot aren't they but they're really densely packed with things. You know, I, I tend to be a poetry reader more than anything else. And the thing I love about poetry is that you can get a whole load of stuff compacted into a very small space. And that to me means that I often come back to read it again and again mm -hmm. and again. And over the years, I get to know the, these poems intimately mm -hmm. or think intimately. Then all of a sudden, I think, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Mm -hmm. Right? It is something else. Um, but actually, what I really think about poetry is that none of it means anything. It just is what it is in the way that a flower in the garden just is what it is. Mm. Real things have no meaning. Mm. And I think that brings me on to this one, I think. Yeah. Blue Horses by Mary Oliver. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Oliver is an American poet. Um, and I've got a bit of a thing for American poetry and have done for a long time and that's got to do with my background and education mm -hmm. and I went to an ordinary comprehensive school I didn't have a classical education when I tried to read a lot of English poetry um, and I do love I do read English poetry um, but when I, I was first starting to read it I found it very difficult because there are a lot of allusions to classical literature mm -hmm. um, and you don't understand them. You can't understand what the poems are about when they start talking about Odysseus and things like that and dropping characters like that, which people with a classical education would get all the references and that would have a whole pack of information that comes with it. Mm -hmm. I didn't get any of that. Mm -hmm. Then I discovered American poetry and they don't do that. Right. It's simple and straightforward and it doesn't matter 
that you didn't have a classical education. It doesn't matter that you come from a particular background. It's totally straightforward. Mm. Um, shall I read one? Oh my God, yeah. I'm gonna read this. This is, from, this is Mary Oliver and it's quite a short poem. Okay. And it's called, If I Wanted a Boat. If I wanted a boat, I would want a boat. If I wanted a boat that bounded hard on the waves, that didn't know starboard from port, and wouldn't learn, that welcomed dolphins and headed straight for the whales, that, when rocks were close, would slide in for a touch or two, that wouldn't keep land in sight and went fast, that leaped into the spray. What kind of life is it always to plan and do, to promise and finish, to wish for the near and the safe? Yes, by the heavens, if I wanted a boat, I would want a boat I couldn't steer. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I wanted a boat, I, I have a boat I can't steer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's it's life, isn't it, as well? Like, we we have this um, this idea that we can control. I've got, I've got these little jars on my shelf, and one says control, and one says illusion. And yeah. I always have them sitting there, because control is complete illusion, and... Um, yeah, but yet we, but yet we try all the time, every single day yeah. of our lives to control our life. Yeah, I always have this image of like when you're a child and you're sitting in the back seat of your father's car and you have a toy steering wheel on the seat and you're going like that, as if really that's what you think that you do think you're driving, yes. and you're not. Yes. Somebody else. Do. <laughs> so I always have this image when I'm thinking I'm trying to control something. I just think, no, I'm just sitting in the back seat going like this, and it has no meaning. Yeah. You know, yeah. It might have an immediate meaning for the next 30 seconds or so, but then chaos just bring, comes back in again and changes But it. then chaos is also vital for rejuvenation and, you know, in nature and life, isn't it? If, it, if there wasn't chaos, chaos, we would all look exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> and do exactly the same things with our lives. And there would be one flower and one tree. There wouldn't be, no, maybe there wouldn't even be that. Who knows? Yeah. Yes, yes. so chaos is we are about chaos we are chaos yeah um next book yes please okay the piece of wild things wendell berry another american poet and essayist um again a short book this 132 pages and it's got lots of poems lots of essays in it and i just i, oh, I just love wendell berry he's a farmer mm -hmm. um a working farmer and basically the poetry he writes just blows me away i just love it you should do another one yeah. <laughs> okay the piece of wild thing this is a very very famous wendell berry poem mm -hmm. and i love this poem and it's, you can see the the sticky on my page is just falling to pieces got to go to it that often the piece of wild things when despair for the world grows in me and i wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of, of grief, sorry, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. These little poems are little stories about managing and living with the things that we have to live with. He's telling the story about when he's frightened and afraid for his children, mm. what he does, he just goes to nature and becomes calm. So- When was that poem written? This one, oh, I don't know. I think, I don't know when that one was written. This, this edition, um, oh, 1964 was the first, publishing of this mm. I mean it's interesting that those thoughts that he's describing very human thoughts and ones that for some reason we think we can avoid and mm. look at us you know 60 odd oh. years on from when that was written and all of us can you know empathize with that feeling can't we absolutely we life is suffering you know it is full of suffering mm. and we have to become resourceful about how we deal with that suffering or we have to fade away. We have to be resourceful. We have to accept it's there and find ways of, of still living a full, 
and happy life within that. This is a such a complicated thing, isn't it? Life is hard and difficult, and there are wars, and there are governments, and there are events in the world that make life harder than they ever need to be. And you can see they're making life harder than they ever need to be. And you could spend your life fighting, or you can find some respite. Um, and we need a balance. We need to be able to find that respite. Mm. And I think just for me, sitting by my back door, watching the sparrows in the tiny little tree in my tiny little city garden, watching the rain dripping off the leaves, gives me that respite, you know, and I find myself and find my center again. Actually, this is who I am. I am just part of the wind and the rain and all these other emanations that come from the world. Mm. We are all just these emanations and the other stuff is um, almost a side issue. Mm. I mean, I know that's quite, could be seen as being quite a dodgy thing to say, but the other things are things that take you away from, from the reality of your humanity. And so we, we, need to we, find also, reality. we seek that though as well, at the same time as we probably have an awareness that are taking us away from the reality. Yeah. We seek them. It's a strange, it's a strange habit we have as humans. <laughs> It is creating that balance is very, very difficult, I think. And I struggle with it constantly. I think, you know, here I meditate and I sit and I have, lead a very peaceful, very quiet life, very peaceful, very quiet. And I see things going on. I see the NHS being folded to pieces. I see food banks grow. You know, all the things that we see every day that we see on the news, if we watch the news. Um, and all of those things that can get your adrenaline up and make you angry and people saying, if you're not angry, you don't understand and your expectations of anger. Um, but it's harmful, you know, and we need to find ways of actually retaining our peace within that. You know? and I also it's, feel that we're not built to carry all these worries. I can't no, believe you know, we used to live in, you know, small communities where we were concerned by the worries of that community. And I, I really yeah. don't feel our brains are meant to be holding on to what's happening in this country, in that country, or, you know. No, we're not designed for that. We are designed. Yeah. I was talking to my wife, Kate, the other day about growing older, right? Mm -hmm. And we're saying, how are we going to deal with this? What are we going to do as a couple? We love each other very deeply. But one of us is going to die at one point. It's inevitable. Mm. One of us. And being a man and being older and from a working class background, it's far more likely to be me than it mm. is her. So mm. the likelihood is that she could be on her own and she could be on her own for 20 years or so. So mm. we have to start thinking, what do we do about that? How do we make that life work for mm. her? You know, That's incredible um, that you talk about that. Well, we do, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's part of life, but I've just written a book for Bloomsbury about how we don't talk about death and we don't yeah. therefore prepare for end of life. Um, we do very much. And we, I think we started it quite a long time ago because I used to... <laughs> I, I have a heart condition, right? I used to pretend to be dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> before, before that came along, right? Oh, and okay. Before that came along. Since I had my heart condition, I've stopped doing that. Yeah. Because <laughs> you do it's you. A, a sort of little bit of humour and a joke. You know, you just lie in bed and you don't wake up and you don't wake up. Or you just lie on the floor and you don't. <laughs> things like that. Just, and it, I just don't, you know, I, you can't afford to do it anymore because it's now become very real. Mm. You know, the potential is real. But, you know, we accept it and live with it. Where are we going to live? All right, how are you going to live? Do you need this house? It's quite a large house. Do you need this house? We live in a street that's a very quiet street. You're going to want people around. So we discuss those things. Really interesting. Yeah. But that's that's also nature, isn't it? Of course it is. I mean, it's, everything's nature. It's like everything's politics. Everything's nature. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm growing old. And actually, a lot of people, I'd like, I like, I like it. I'm enjoying it. Mm. I'm really enjoying it. Because well, the alternative is not so palatable. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But also, you get certain permissions as you get older, you know. You're allowed to do certain things. You're allowed to just sit and look out the window all day long, if that's what you feel like doing, you know. Mm. I'm allowed to dress slightly eccentrically, which I often do, right? And go and sit in, in a cafe and drink coffee all day. <laughs> I'm allowed to do that, you know? I'm allowed to sit on the park bench with a walking stick and read a book, you know? I think if you're 20 years old, you're 
other 20 years old might 20 year olds who you know might be walking by and discourage you from doing that they certainly would have done when i was a younger man but now it's like there he is <laughs> sitting on the bench with his stick reading his book again making notes in his notebook well um, yeah why not embrace it when you feel you feel more comfortable doing it as well when you get older so it's it's actually quite good fun Mm. you know and also we have this thing where we do have fun we planned fun in like um quite a few years ago we got married again right my 60th birthday was coming up and she said what do you want to do for your birthday and I said I want to get married again so we went to Scotland just the two of us with Mm. a piper and we stood on the beach and got married again right and we started this thing called 10 years of fun and we're just looking at things how do we make this thing more fun how do we enjoy this little thing a little bit more yeah last book tell us what have you got there i have got annie dillard st- teaching a stone to talk mm. i love annie dillard's writing um she's written es- she's a- she writes essays i think she's a novelist as well i haven't read any of her novels because i very rarely read novels mm. Um, but I do read essays. I was in the bookshop in London uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was really delighted to see that they have an essay section. Oh, in the really? Bookshop. Yeah, just by the door. In It was Waterstones on... Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the street. This is what happened, you see. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't. No. <laughs> um, and so anyway, Annie Dillard teaching us stone to talk. And her writing is just beautiful. She has written a book. I would recommend anybody who is interested in writing to read her work about writing. Mm. Um, because her she, well, it's just beautiful. I mean, you, any line you pick out, you'll just find something absolutely wonderful. Work. Um, insects. I like insects for their stupidity. A paper wasp, Polistes, is fumbling at the stained glass window on my right. I saw the same sight in the same spot last Sunday. Psst, idiot, sweetheart, go around by the door. I hope we all seem as endearingly stupid to God, bumbling down into lamps, running half-wit across the floor, banging for days at the hinge of an open door. I hope so. It doesn't seem likely. Just beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, And I came across her a couple of years ago, and she just writes about the stuff that we see and does it so very very well mm. and i've I, I, in fact i'm going to read this one again now. <laughs> <laughs> so those are my four books anyway and oddly three of them two of them are poets three of them are americans yeah it's really and, interesting what you said in terms of the americans and the class or the classless writing yeah. i also yeah. you know have a working class background went to a comprehensive didn't have any knowledge of the classics and so when I had my daughter I really wanted to instill these stories in her so that she had this base level of knowledge because it does filter into everything into your into films into you know the writing and you know references and I don't know I I've always had the kind of working class chip on my shoulder about not being clever enough. Um, yeah. I was doing an MA when I was 40 because I'd never been to university or anything. Um, I, I don't know if I, that changed me. I don't think I came out feeling more clever. It's, yeah, it's a funny one, that, isn't it? Because I did a similar thing. I was homeless for quite a while when I left home when I was 16 and I was homeless for a while. And then I got various jobs and then I went back to college and I worked in a chicken shop at night and I went to art school because that's what I could get into with what I had. And you come out and suddenly I was alienated from all the other people in my culture around me because nobody in my family had been to university or college, you know, so I didn't fit in with them. And I didn't fit in with the other people either who came from middle class backgrounds. Yeah. So you end up having to forge your own path and say, OK, this I have to dig all my own channels here to find the way down. And it is it is. I don't know. It gives you a bit of backbone, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's resilience, isn't it? But I think that's yeah. that feeling of not fitting in here or there is one that a lot of people are familiar with. And so. Yeah. 
you know, bringing things back to basics in terms of nature and what nature yeah. teaches us about resilience as well. Yeah. You can see why that would. Uh, yeah. You walk out of your front door and go to the nearest park right? and there are part, you don't need to live in the countryside. You don't need to live near a forest or a beach. Mm. Everywhere has parks and you go to your nearest park and you find a quiet bench and there will be bees and there will be hoverflies and there you will belong, you mm. know? you will feel at home there. All you have to do is go quiet and watch them and listen to them and you will mm. feel belonging there. Mm. With other people, not always the case. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> okay, well, that's what a lovely way to end our chat, Mark. Um, thank you so much. So, um, You're very well. Yeah, thank you. So just to recap um, this um interview with mark obviously if you got to this stage you will know that it was on youtube um and also it will be transcribed into my um newsletter so that you can find the books and 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 find the website my website the book room website and order them you're welcome to order the whole collection because <laughs> um you know mark's given it such a great sell um so yeah so we'll uh, we'll leave it there but thanks so much mark Thank you, Anna. Thank you.